So if you look at China, for, gosh, maybe three decades, it's been the workshop of the world. A lot of consumer product segments, especially if they're high labor content, 90, up to 90% of them are made in China. That's going to change because over those three decades, Chinese wages have been growing double digit. They've reached the point now where China is not the cheapest place to make things. So I think Western companies that have sourced from China have to figure out the answer to the question everybody poses, which is what's the next China? A common answer is there is no next China. There won't, there won't be a country as big as China with a low labor cost, uh, low supply of low labor costs, and um, um, a government that may, was very business friendly. So, so that's not going to happen. I think a strategy a lot of companies are following is China plus one, mm -hmm. where the plus one is, is the, the usual suspects, Indonesia, India, Vietnam. Um, and then the next wave of countries after that is uncertain, but people mention Ethiopia, Myanmar, uh, even the United States as right. where manufacturing will return. So where will manufacturing go as China is no longer cheap, I think is, an, is a decision that people have to figure out. And everybody's looking at, at where to go from here. Um, when I, um, I first visited in China in 82 and then 86 and then didn't go back for 20 years. I went back in 2006 visiting uh, a town called Dongguan, gritty industrial town. My first thought was, can I hold my breath for six hours? I mean, the, the air quality is terrible in China. So uh, if you were to change something about the, the deal China's had in the last three decades since they opened up in 79, uh, it's all about quality of life of the people in the country. Uh, economically, the quality of life's gone up, especially for people who emigrated to the coast. Uh, other aspects of quality of life, like the environment, have gone down. So that might be one feature yeah. to learn from Chinese experience. I'm no expert, but I think it tends to be subordinate. I think that clean air and clean water are it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? First right. is enough to eat. <laughs> Then, then you worry about clean air. So China has crossed that threshold now. I think that that um, the standard of living economically has risen to the point where clean air becomes a priority for them. Well, some companies I would you can think of Western companies. You can think of Chinese companies. Um, leading lights within China, I would mention uh, Luantai, which is the largest private label apparel manufacturer based in Dongguan. They make for all the well-known Western brands. <coughs> I would mention uh, South Ocean is a supplier of sweaters and other garments whose founder bought Michael Coors right. um, and has bankrolled that company to, I think, the largest IPO in, in apparel history. So they've been good at integrating the downstream branding with the upstream productive capacity. Uh, and I would mention an internet retailer called Ihaudian, based in Shanghai, that uh, founded in 08, they're now a billion dollar revenue fastest growing company in Asia, according to Deloitte. And Walmart recently acquired a 51% stake in them. So those are some Chinese companies that stand out. Uh, people who source from China, gosh, there's a long list of, of ones that are pretty good at it. Um, I would mention Flextronics as a producer of electronics products based in the California Bay Area that has huge complex in China, endowment. Uh, they're pretty sophisticated in their use of uh, Chinese production. Lots of apparel companies, Ralph Lauren, Nike, New Balance, uh, are all good at sourcing from China. And I would mention Walmart, mm -hmm. 
Walmart is both sourcing from China and selling into China through Walmart China. I think from that perspective, to me, the most interesting question of all is how important there's a value chain that starts with um, artistic, inspirational innovation of a product, the iPhone, um, a nice looking dress coming out of Michael Coors design shop. Uh, through technical design, how do you translate that product concept into something you produce? Component sourcing, manufacturing, distribution. Those are all steps in the process which tend to be located in different places and done by different companies as a result of the outsourcing and offshoring. So you go back to the 60s, 70s. That was all co-located. So Motorola uh, designed in the US, sold in the US, produced in the US, all within house. So the need for coordination between a product designer and a, and a person making that product, and there's a lot of need for coordination, was readily facilitated. Now we've disaggregated. So different companies do those different steps in different places. Uh, that, I think, can hamper the ability to develop new products. So coordination between product development and product manufacturing, I think, has been reduced. How to preserve that while still allowing you to locate everything in the, in the best spot for that step, I think, will be the supply chain uh, challenge, or it's what supply chains have to say to product innovators. <laughs>